I did my pre-interview with today's guest, Chris Gray, as he was riding a camel in Jordan. He doesn't work mornings, hosts a TV show on Sky Channel and travels for free at the pointy end of the plane around 15 times a year. All this whilst running a multi-million dollar property empire. (laughs) I'm not sure whether I hate the guy or I'm in total admiration. Before we figure that out uh, and get stuck into episode 409 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, the marketing gold is made possible thanks to Design Crowd, American Express and Prosper. Design Crowd is the world's number one custom design marketplace where, with access to 550,000 designers, graphic designers, you'll get the perfect design every time. You can get $100 off your brief at designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. It's a great offer. And we're brought to you by Prosper, Australia's number one online lender to small businesses. You can check them out at Prosper, that's P-R-O-S-P-A dot com forward slash Timbo and American Express, good old American Express. If you'd like to find out how your business expenses can reward you, then Google Amex Business. I think you'll like what you'll find there. And it's a little strategy today's guest uses to fly free around the world. And now... On with the show. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show. A successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Reed. And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. I'm your host, Tim Reed. You, infinitely more importantly... You're a motivated business owner, ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Big show today. Always a big show. Property buyer's agent Chris Gray shares how he's built a business that enables him to live a very, very enviable lifestyle. Australia's most famous baker, Tom O'Toole, is heading off on possibly the craziest road trip ever. We check in with him just before he leaves. Melbourne SEO Services' Dave Jennings explains why having mountains of content on your website might not be the best practice going around. And I give away more prizes thanks to the Small Business Big Marketing Monster Prize Draw. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Quick update on my Deep Dive Mastermind. Starts in Melbourne this week. Uh, It's full. There's a waiting list for the second Melbourne group. And I'm going to announce a date for a Sydney Mastermind in the coming weeks. If you are interested in the second Melbourne group or the Sydney group, uh, email me, tim at timreid, reid.com.au. It's an opportunity, a half day every two months for you and me and nine, eight or nine other motivated small business owners to get together and bust through some limiting beliefs around your marketing, generate some ideas around your marketing, be accountable around your marketing and have a lot of fun along the way. Now, you and I will be meeting some amazing business owners and marketers over the coming weeks. We'll catch up with Prosper's Bo Batoli, whose business was recently ranked, check this out, by the Financial Times as the Asia Pacific's fastest growing business. It was out of a thousand businesses. And we're going to meet video marketing specialist Jules Watkins, who will reveal how to make high converting marketing videos. He's an ex-BBC film director and he is good. Righto, that brings us to today's guest, Chris Gray. He started investing in property at the age of 22. He retired from full-time work as an accountant at Deloitte at 31. He's now 46 and Chris has a $15 million plus property portfolio of his own and he runs a business called Your Empire, a buyer's agency that builds property portfolios for time-poor professionals just like he did for himself. Your Empire buys one-to-do properties a week 
and spends up to $5 million a year on renovations for its clients. Chris also hosts the Smart Investing Show on Sky News. He travels overseas 10 to 15 times a year and, and for free, by the way. He'll explain how he does that and is into car racing, motor yachts and flying helicopters. Oh, boy. I'm cross already. I started off by asking Chris to paint us a picture of a typical month in his life. Well, it's the kind of things that's probably going to annoy a lot of people. I'm one of of those people that uh, go that way. So, look, typically I go overseas once a month. So I try and do about 10 to 15 trips a year overseas, uh, generally business-related, but I'm doing it with people that I, I love and, uh, and love hanging around with. Um, probably do a couple of interstates. And I've got a new plan for this year, which is basically no meetings in the morning. Genius. Yep. I, I should have thought about it years ago. Because yes. a lot of people take Thursdays and Fridays off, and I thought, look, that's not mega. Let's just clear mornings. So basically, 7 to 8 is just clear the email, so all those kind of disappear and that's set up for the day. 8 to 9 is actually trying to play with my kids and actually do board games. And I'm, I'm not a natural dad, so I need to sit myself down and actually physically do something with them. Drop them there's off. There's a massive assumption there that kids want to play board games at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so my daughter's probably still sleeping, so she doesn't really do it. But I'm just trying to spend some time with my son. Yeah. And like we play Monopoly and, and things like that, which he loves. Uh, drop them at school at 9, do the gym from 9 till 10, 10.30. And then do a stretching or a massage class from like 10.30 to 11.30 and then go home and then set up for 12 o'clock and it's time for lunch. And probably have a couple of meetings in the afternoon and then most evenings I'm out. So uh, Mondays I do Sky News and then Tuesday to Thursday and Friday generally some kind of networking or event that I might be speaking at or going along to and then kind of Saturday and Sunday with the family. So it's just variety really. Yeah. So you're starting work at midday or shortly thereafter, but you're working into the night. So you might be taking mornings off, but you're still working a relatively yeah. normal eight, nine-hour day. So look, for all doing the, what you love. Yeah. So for all the small businesses, we all know it's twenty-four-seven. Mm-hmm. You've got your own business. There isn't on and off. You're always thinking about the business, and so it's more just to try and set aside time to get fit because I, I drink a lot, I'm out a lot, I'm entertaining, and I don't love fitness, so I've got to force myself to do it, and so. Most of the time, even if I'm down the gym, technically I'm networking. Like my cars are plastered with advertising all over it. So I'm almost a walking billboard 24-7 anyway. So uh, <laughs> so quite often if you ask my wife, she'll say he works 24-7. If you ask my friends, they'll say he never works. And if you ask the tax man, then maybe it's 50-50. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> well, you've certainly built a business that you love. So where'd the idea for your empire come from? Sure. So I'm an accountant by trade. I'm not a great accountant. Oh, sorry. Exactly. Sorry, lost me there. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I was just good naturally with numbers. So basically at 22, I worked out I couldn't afford a one-bedroom unit because it would take all my wages to pay the mortgage, but I could afford a three-bedroom house because I could rent two rooms out uh-huh. and even though the mortgage was more than my wages, I could live for free. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my school base. So basically I gave up work at 31 out of Deloitte's. I tried to salary sacrifice a Ferrari. And they worked out the fringe benefits tax was more than my wages. <laughs> so they knew something yeah, was wrong there. Got it. But basically I was paying it out of property profits. And so I basically didn't work for a few years and everyone said, well, how come you're not working? You've got, you drive Ferraris, you've got a boat, you live on the beach, you're not working. So I started telling people my story and people believed me because I didn't have any vested interest. So I didn't sell the mortgages uh, or houses because I had no job. Yes. And... So from there, then I started doing courses because people said, well, can you teach us a bit more? And then from doing the courses, then a CEO just said to me, look, I don't want to learn how to do this stuff. I don't want to deal with the agents. Can I pay you? Will you do it for me? And that's really where a business started. So it all so, so, came so out of demand. That sounded so incredibly easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. Oh, it so wasn't. At, yeah, yeah. At, 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 just going back, at 22, you in Australia or England? In the UK. In the UK. So at 22, you, you want to get your own home, Yeah. Right? You go, well, I can't afford to just have one that I only live in, but the idea of having one with two extra bedrooms that generate revenue through getting tenants in and I live for free. So you get your own home, you get your first home. Yeah. That that makes sense. Yeah. You're at Deloitte for the next nine years. You are are trapped, trapped in a cubicle working for the man, but... You are continuing to buy property yourself? Yeah, so I bought basically six over that time. And so this this was the, I think, the clever thing. So Deloitte's normally it's six-hour 
kind of you know recording the six minute uh, oh, yep. intervals. Not that we ever did that, but I basically had a really cool boss, uh, Deborah. I'll give it, give her a plug. She was a good boss. I think Deborah and, listens actually. <laughs> and <laughs> we basically had an agreement that if I got my work done, I could do my property investing on the side. What a cool boss! So I became the most efficient person around Deloitte's because I knew if anyone ever complained that I hadn't done my work, I'd lose that privilege. Sure. And I said, you don't need to pay me bonuses. You don't need to try and motivate me. I'm self-motivated. I'm going to be so out there. So I wasn't on email. I wasn't on Facebook doing all that kind of stuff, sitting around chatting, because I was trying to get my work done in 20 hours so I could then be out with the solicitors or looking at properties and doing everything else. And so that's basically the mentality I had. What do you think about that mentality that Deborah so very courageously and probably pretty smartly said, you know, you, you do get your work done here and then do whatever you want to. But also do I, you, I, I don't know if she had any choice. Yeah, right, she was going to lose you. Because the other thing was is with staff bonuses, she says we go and pay someone five grand for working hard all year, we change their life. You go and buy another set of tyres on the Ferrari. <laughs> because at the time I was earning 80 grand a year, which is 60 grand after tax. Same time from this was early 2000, so the property market was growing. I was making 600 grand a year, capital gains, so I wasn't paying tax because I wasn't selling. So you earn 60 grand for working or 600 grand for doing nothing, and that's the reality. Mm -hmm. So it was very hard for them to motivate an employee that doesn't need money Mm -hmm. because everyone else, you either threaten to sack them or you give them the carrot of uh, a bonus. And this is what I'm kind of against with, say, a normal employee relationship or when small business have staff, there's no incentive for that person to really work any harder. Whereas I was the most kind of energetic person there because I had a reason to do something, that it wasn't getting a little bonus, it was making hundreds and hundreds of thousands from property investing. How many staff have you got now? So technically I've got none and I've got no office. But... We effectively all work from home because I don't want to come into the city every day. I, I work in or I live in Darling Point. We've got 360-degree views around Sydney. So we're in a round building, whole floor. So why would I want to... This is to, your home. This is a home, a rented home. And so why would I ever want to go and have an office? And then staff, I learned from Deloitte's, is first of all, you've got to pay them. Then you've got to hope that they do some work. Then you hope that they don't sue you or leave or do or nick all your customers. <laughs> And so in real estate, it's quite different anyway, is effectively everyone runs their own business but under my banner or under under my uh, logos Ah. and they're all effectively self-employed. Huh. So if they want to earn money, they can earn a million dollars if they want. But I don't care if they work 100 hours or 1,000 hours or two hours. It's all about you put money in the bank and we all split it. And if you're super efficient and you can generate more money in less time, you get paid more money per hour. Genius. And so it's it's just like running a business. Is If you've got a great business, you earn lots of money. Mm-hmm. If you go in and do 80 hours a week but you don't actually generate any business, you don't get paid. So uh, at 31, you've got six properties under your belt. It's time to leave Deloitte. Yep. What, what was that decision? Was that just like, you know what, I don't need Deloitte anymore and, you know, it's time to do my own thing? So I actually – it was actually a really hard decision because I've been brought up – my dad was a doctor, mum was a nurse. I was brought up as a job for life. And I actually needed a life coach, and life coaches were only just invented back in early yeah. 2000s. And I, th- I still think that the life coach that I had still doesn't know what I did, but it was her mentality that got me over the mindset of leaving work. So I thought I earn 60 grand a year, so five grand a month. If I go and put, say, 60 grand in a bank account and pay myself five grand a month, it's the same as having a job but not turning up. And it was that mentality that ah. I needed to leave the workforce. Huh. Because everyone's reaction when I email from Deloitte saying I've I've retired, it's oh, you can't do that. You need a job. Like there's all the negativity and oh no, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm. But the mentality was well, as if I'm getting five grand a month, who cares whether I turn up to an office? Exactly. And one year led to two, to three, and then suddenly, fifteen years later, still haven't had a proper job. <laughs> Unemployable, probably. Exactly. So you, you leave Deloitte. Uh, how long – you didn't have the idea for your empire, the business, at that point in time? No. So what I did is um, a mate of mine was trying to get into filmmaking and he started doing extras work, you know, how to, hanging out on film sets and, and movies. One of the great miniseries, by the way, with Ricky <laughs> Gervais too. Love yep. it. And, and I turned up and I think you had to pay 200 bucks for your pictures or something and I said, look, I don't want to be on TV – I don't want to act, I'm not an actor, I don't want to say anything, I just want to see how you make a movie or an advert or something like that. And you spend all this time kind of hanging out and you're just talking to people and I used to 
give my free property advice as I always always do. And one of the guys found a lead through his agency that Channel Nine were after a uh, a property expert to go on um, a show called My Home TV, a, a packer thing. And um, in short, I basically got the job a few years later. And um, we did, I think, 37 shows on Saturday mornings, a lifestyle show. So we go up to Queensland, they put a house on the back of a truck and move it somewhere. Oh, yeah. We do all these amazing things. And so I just built the reputation of being the independent expert because I didn't have a barrier to push. Yeah, right. And, and that, that's the big thing because everyone that has got a barrier to push, everyone's got a vested interest in giving you the certain advice. So I guess I always wanted to be that corporate speaker rather than, I guess, the spruker. And my market always was high income earners rather than, I guess, your average Aussie in a way. And so um, I just built it up from being a, a TV expert, I so guess. So you're literally just living a, a luxurious life of not working at this point in time. The TV opportunity comes along and you take it. And yeah. it was at that point where there was some enough people were asking for advice and how do you do what you do that you think, you know what, I've got to turn this into a business. And, and, and also the same thing is, is so I had about three and a half million of property then that was going up at, say, 10, 20% a year. So I was making that 600, but I knew that 600 wasn't going to last. And suddenly, if you don't work, you've then got 24 7 to spend. And so suddenly your expenses go up. And so I just could see that, look, maybe I need a bigger portfolio than three and a half million to uh, to retire on. Because one of the things I look at, looking at your business, I go, why do why go and show other people how to do it when you could just continue to do it yourself, enjoy the fruits of that and not have clients and businesses to worry about or, you know, contractors... Yeah, so in the early days you go through the tough times, whereas now, because I've been in it for 10 years, I've got the easy side, so I don't deal with most of the stuff now, which is great. But the reality is with property is two things. Is First of all is if I'm building the relationship with the agents to try and get off market deals, it's a lot of work. Just Even I, I can only buy one or two a year at the most. So if I'm investing that much time in a relationship, I may as well be buying 50 or 100. Mm, okay. For that same relationship, effectively. Yeah, yeah. And it's easier to get better deals if I'm buying in bulk 50 or 100 properties than I'm just buying one. Mm-hmm. So that's part of it. The second part of it is in the good old days of 2000s, you could get no doc or low doc loans. Tick a mm-hmm. box, you can get an 80% loan. Now the banks are an absolute nightmare because of APRA. And so now you've got to have an income. So even if you've got a million dollar debt free property, you still need an income to pull the mortgage out. Mm-hmm. So. Effectively, the business is the income side of my business and it pays all my expenses, my travel, all that kind of stuff. But the real money comes from the property investing. So explain your empire now. How does it work? Sure. So effectively what we do is we help people create wealth from property and typically we're dealing with high-income earners that want to buy in the blue-chip suburbs. So we're not trying to find the latest, greatest thing. We're not trying to suddenly do a granny flat or subdivide or take massive risks um, because quite often hotspots don't turn into a hotspot and they, they crash, like the mining towns. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to buy that Bondi Beach, the St Kilda, Paran type thing, and we're trying to say we're buying it today for half a million or a million bucks and we think in seven or ten years it's going to be worth two million. But you go to auction, there's 20 or 30 people over it, it'll go for 1.1 rather than a million dollars. We can get it for a million dollars and buy it before it comes on the market. How? So (laughs) by basically... This is your secret sauce. (laughs) No, so it's not a secret. It's basically having that relationship. So our biggest thing is is we're ethical, we're honest, and we do what we say we're going to do. So say you've bought a... Say you're a vendor, so you own your own home, cost you 500, it's now worth a million, and an agent says, I could sell it to you for 1.1 at auction, which is great. Sell it for you. Sell it for you for 1.1. But you've suddenly seen your dream property or or your partner has and it goes to auction in one or two weeks and you don't want people coming through the house and you want that certainty. If I come up and say, I'll give you a million dollars now, it's guaranteed. Now, sure, you might get 1.1 at auction, but if you only get 999, you're going to lose your dream home. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? So so how how are you approaching that vendor? Through the agents, effectively. And so we're saying the same thing to the agents is you're super busy. You're, you're selling 20 properties. Whether you sell it for 1 or 1.1, 1. 1, you get, you the, get the same commission. Yeah. And so it really doesn't make any difference. So we're the guarantee. And so the, the easy analogy is, is when you sell a second-hand car, do most people do it themselves or do they trade it in? Mm-hmm. They trade, trade it in. in. Why do they do it? Because they hate dealing with tire kickers. Do you get the best price at trade in? No, you no. don't. It's a guaranteed deal. Mm-hmm. That's what we are. Same, same. Yeah. 
Genius. So everyone thinks that everyone's after the, the highest dollar or the cheapest the kind of thing. It's never the case. Never? Oh, n- not never, but pretty much. Not the- every vendor has got a dream property in mind that's going to auction in two weeks so that sure. you can come in and be the But a lot night. of people don't want the neighbours to find out. They might go through a divorce. Right. They just don't want the grief. They don't want to deal with agents. They might come to us direct. There's a whole host of different reasons of why you just don't want the grief. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like the same for employees. Does every employee go for the highest paying job? No, not necessarily. Sometimes they just want... Jobs I love. Yeah, they want to work at Google or, or where it's, it's kind of better lifestyle living. Mm-hmm. So this is the whole thing about any kind of sales or marketing is you're trying to go for something that it's not all price. If you're selling on price... You've got a pretty screwed up business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a one-way street really, isn't it? Yeah, Bing unless you're street. a Bingley or something like that and you're making millions. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> so, so, okay, so right now your empire, you're out there, you're finding sourcing properties um, off the plan, talking to developers, going to vendors. No, so most of the time we're just buying second hand. Right. So, again, we're not even taking the punt on brand new and taking the risk that it will be built because we think most of the good areas are already fully built up. So they can only build in the secondary areas. We don't want to buy in the secondary areas. We mm. want the, the blue chips. And if you can buy in the blue chips, they'd sell it for $2 million, which is then hasn't got a great yield. Mm-hmm. So we're not buying the super sexy, gorgeous stuff that every other person buys and loses money on. We buy the ugly duckling that can then be renovated and, and, and tied it up. And you guys do that as well, right? You we can do that as well. You manage yeah. property, you, like landlord type set up as well. So, and- so basically people come to us and they don't want to do anything to deal with it. So if they've already got their team, they can do that. Otherwise, we can get the mortgage brokers, bank, bankers, financial planners. We can take it through council. So whatever they need to do around residential property, effectively we can help them. Okay. What do you love about it? I just love talking property. <laughs> so I can talk underwater, I can talk at two right. or three in the morning. It's just my normal language in a way. And I've got a passion and when people see on video, then they just see my kind of eyes light up and, and my face. And and I'd say 90% of what I do these days is for free. So I'm not charging for my time. Effectively, it's marketing. But my TV shows, these kind of shows, a lot of my travel overseas, Mm -hmm. I'm speaking for free Mm -hmm. and I honestly don't care. If people want to go off and do it themselves, like my books, we've produced, I don't know, 60 or 70,000 books, never sold one, all (laughs) given away for free. And so my idea is is to teach the average population, go off and do it yourselves, you're not going to be my client anyway. Mm -hmm. I'd rather deal with the high income earners that have already got the money, they just need to be shown how to do it. Whereas if someone's got no money, no job, no nothing, I'm not a genius, I'm not God, I can't, te- I can't create money from mm-hmm. nothing. Uh, other people can apparently, <laughs> but I, I definitely know I can't. H- how do you weed them out? So you're giving away a lot for free. Yeah. And a lot, of spe- a lot of business owners struggle with that. I mean my whole concept in the Boomerang Effect, my book is around helpful marketing, which is basically understand your, your prospect, what problems and blockages they have and help them solve it through yeah. giving them, whether it be a, giving them information via a podcast or a video or speaking from stage or whatever it is. And business owners struggle with that because they feel as though they're giving away their IP, their point of difference, right? But yeah. clearly you and I, we both agree that's not the case in giving yeah. away things for free. Your, your free is interesting. Yours is twofold. One is you're giving it away to people who you know just aren't going to be able to afford to be a client of your empire. Uh, but you're also doing it to build a personal brand and a yeah. and an awareness around, oh, if I do want to buy property and I do have the money, then, then Chris is the guy to speak to. Yeah, because if you're in there for the long term, then you're not after that dollar today. So one of the really big speakers, one of the highest paid speakers in Australia is um, a guy, Craig Rispin, mm-hmm. who is a futurist. a futurist. Yep, He goes and speaks to all the PAs. Because the PAs, yeah. they're the ones that actually book him. Yep. And so even if I um, help all the, the, I guess, the general nation and they're not my direct customers, they're still speaking to other people that suddenly have got the money. Yeah. And if my reputation around town is, is Chris is great, he gives everything away for free, he helped me and, and I get people coming in off the street saying, hey, I, I heard your seminar 10 years ago, I bought four properties in the middle of places I haven't even heard of. And it's there's no better thing in the world yes. than having someone thank you. And so I'm sure kind of re- uh, reciprocity, always the hard word yeah, to yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Um, 
what what comes around goes around. And I still want to go to heaven. So for all the bad things I do in life, <laughs> then it. hopefully it balances the uh, the karma out. Well, that decision's just yet to be made, uh, Chris. <laughs> you, um, you you say when I asked what you love about it, you said you, you just love property. Is that really the truth, or is property the vehicle that's given you the opportunity to live the lifestyle that you love? Is it, is the lifestyle that you love, or is it property? Great question, Timbo. Oh, I'm on fire, aren't I? Hey, before we find out Chris's real truth, here's a genius idea if you're wanting to get something designed without mortgaging the family home. Cheap, quick, great. I used to work with a designer who'd force me to choose two of those three options whenever I wanted something designed. As a small business owner with limited funds, it drove me nuts that I could never have all three. That's why I love Design Crowd. You see, Design Crowd is a website that helps startups, small businesses, and marketers outsource custom design from logos and business cards to websites and landing pages. In fact, Design Crowd gives you access to over 550,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco, ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. Here's how it works you post a brief describing your design need. Within hours, you'll receive your first design, and over the next three to 10 days, a typical project will receive 60 to 100 different designs from designers around the world. You then pick your favourite, make any changes, and pay the designer. You know, whether you're an entrepreneur looking to set up your brand or an established business that needs marketing collateral designed, Design Crowd is your answer. For a special $100 VIP listener offer, go to designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo or enter the discount code Timbo when posting a project. See, now you can have cheap, quick and great design thanks to Design Crowd. Hey, hang around after this interview as two listeners share what marketing ideas are working for them. Plus, we'll hear from Tom O'Toole from the Beechworth Bakery, who is about to set out on a crazy, crazy fundraising road trip. But first, let's get back to your empire's Chris Gray, who is about to reveal if it's property or the lifestyle property gives him that he truly loves. So kind of half property, half numbers. So um, <laughs> no lifestyle. <laughs> oh, the, the, on sale, love lifestyles are given. Yeah, that's, right. that's a deep thing. So my very first speech was to CPA Australia, uh, the accounting body, and it was back in I don't know early two thousands, and I had about seven hundred people. So my first speech ever was to like seven hundred people. How? And through Deloitte. Uh, no, it was actually through um, like a networking kind of group or a marketing a group. Of, you've been doing a bit of TV and had a bit of profile. Yeah, so I've done the TV but I'd never actually spoken before as in doing a live speech. And to tr- the first question I asked them is who thinks you should pay off your home loan? And, of course, the accountants, they put two hands up in the air and and to spend the next hour trying to convince them that there's an argument not to buy your own home, that the mathematics actually makes sense to rent it instead, I love that mental challenge to try and get super clever people to not necessarily change their opinions but to think, hey, maybe there's a different way of thinking about Mm -hmm. things. And we deal with people from school kids up to people worth half a billion, a billion dollars. And again, is I've got one thing that I can talk to them that they don't necessarily know or it's a different argument they haven't heard before. And I I haven't created anything new. Mm -hmm. I've just got my own way of doing it. I love having those debates and, and... yeah, telling clever people that earn half a million, a million dollars that are working their backsides yeah, off 80 hours a week mortgage. and I'm actually, I'm doing pretty much nothing with a better lifestyle to say, well, working hard actually isn't the way to go. Oh, you are playing Monopoly at 8 o'clock in the morning. I think that's, that's <laughs> fairly hard work. Goodness me. Oh, no, this is uh, kids' Monopoly, though, not the, not the real one. <laughs> there you go. And you're brutal, Dad. You're just like, you're not going to win, mate. I'm going to, you know. Oh, no, it's he. I, I play hard to hard yeah, to, to get yeah. and, yeah, it's 50-50. He's, uh, he's, he's good as well. <laughs> We're chatting with Chris Gray, who is the founder of Your Empire. I don't even know how to pigeonhole you. A property... Uh, so kind of a bar's, bar's agent, advocate, bar, agent bar expert, yeah, whatever. Your Empire, are you happy with that name? Every time I say it, I feel like I have to qualify it saying, I'm not talking about Your Empire, I'm talking about the business. Yeah, because originally... So I don't know anything about marketing, or I, I, oh, I don't believe I, sure I, I do. That. 
So when we came up with the name originally, that's when the TV show was called My Home and the agency came up with Your Empire and I said, no, it shouldn't be Your Empire, it should be My Empire. But I guess it depends. If I'm talking to you, then I'm saying Your Your Empire, Empire. then I'm talking about you. So anyway, I just said, look, if you think that's the right word, then go and do it. I thought it was a bit elitist building your own castle in the UK. I didn't think it would go down well. But a lot of people seem to love it, so, um, yeah, happy to go with the flow. Seems to work here. Yeah. Oh, that's fair enough. Tell me, um, I want to talk about marketing and how you've built this brand, but you do travel a lot. You travel, what would you say, 15 times a year? So roughly 10 to 15 times a, tri- a year with my wife's permission. She's she, we, We've got an agreement for 15 trips is okay. She yeah. goes along? Uh, on some of them, yeah. On some of them? So, so, some of them with, with my wife, some of them with the kids, some of them just the, the lads, and then a whole bunch for business and education and learning as well. You travel at the pointy end of the plane. Yeah. And how do you do that? And I haven't paid for a ticket in and five, six years. That's right. Yeah, that major yeah. component. It's free. Now, because you actually rang me before the, this interview a few days ago and I was, it was, I think, six in the morning. I was in Jordan. the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan, just about to get on a camel yes. and have my earpiece on. And um, I mentioned, well, it's all through Amex Points and I, I completely forgot Amex was a sponsor of the show, but this is what I firmly believe is... I met a guy called Steve Huey from I Fly Flat. Oh, yeah, well, he's been on the show. Oh, right, okay, cool. And I think I was one of his um, fourth or fifth customers and I just got it because I used to I used to get a 100,000 points on my Amex and convert it to $1,000 of Myers vouchers and give it to my wife. So I got no pleasure. <laughs> then loads of people said they were flying business and first class and I tried to go on the sites and I just couldn't work out how the hell it all worked. And so that's what Steve's business does. So Steve tells you what credit cards to get, and typically it's Amex because that gives you the most points. He then can work the airline systems to know what routes that you want to take. And sometimes he'll even search for six months to try and find you that flight. And I'm trying to book six or 12 months in advance because I want to get these uh, the right kind of flight. And so he then teaches me how to get more points out of my business and um, so effectively I generate one or two million points a year. So my 10 or 15 flights and, and with my wife as well, then we fly business or first. So I f- flew first to um, Jordan and back, which was a 15-hour and a three-hour flight. Uh, so what you're doing is putting all your expenses, I mean every single business expense you can so on my rent. Amex. So again, my staff that aren't staff, they're contractors, effectively I pay them through American Express as well, plus the ATO, <laughs> plus my rent at <laughs> home. It plus all my taxes. And so, look, some of those points you've got to pay for. So yes. some people do give you a surcharge, so it's not maybe completely free and you've still got to pay for your uh, taxes on the airlines. But in reality is I wouldn't pay 10 or 20 grand for a first-class flight, but I don't mind taking one. <laughs> Love it. Let's talk marketing. You said the other day as you were boarding a camel in Jordan, uh, you said something just off the cuff, marketing should be fun. Yeah. I totally agree. Many, uh, I would hope most people listening to this show think it is fun because that's why they're listening. But many business owners struggle with it. What do you mean about marketing being fun? This is serious business. And look, I don't think it's just marketing, I think it's business. Business, okay. And look, I'm not sure who I learned it off, but I think there's plenty of mentors out there, like the, the big kind of US kind of guys, that would say is make, make stuff fun. Um, probably one of my earliest jobs, I actually did recruiting before I joined Deloitte's. And we had to make, uh, I think, 10 connections on the phone every morning and 10 in the afternoon, so 20 a day. And so that meant you probably had to ring 50 people to get connected to uh, to that 20. And it's like, make it fun. Take the phone down to the beach or go on a boat or go and do it wherever. I had a guest uh, years ago, Brad Smith, who was very big on outbound cold calling. Yeah. And clearly a lot of people don't like that. But what he did with his team was say, come in, dress up. Today's outbound cold calling day. So guys would come in with mullet wigs and Ray-Ban sunglasses and completely get out of their own heads and be a character and, yeah. and had a real laugh doing it. But that's the thing is, that's what you've got to do. You've got to try and turn it into something fun because then... Ideally, there's no difference between work and play. So that's where the earlier comment of my wife might say, I work 60 or 80 hours a week or 24-7. My friends will say I'm doing nothing. But technically, is I'm trying to attract high-income earners to my business and they either get it or they don't. I'm not going to get those guys by picking up the phone saying, hey, do you want to buy a property? 
But if I'm out at the racetrack or I'm overseas or I'm travelling all the time and people say, Chris, every time I look at Facebook, you're travelling or you're on a boat or you're in a car or you're doing something. And I say, yeah, well, that's that's how it works. So we do lots of events on, on boats. So I've got a, a boat syndicate that I'm a part of. And again, like the iFly Flat is, don't pay for a whole boat yourself. <laughs> you pay for an eighth of it because Time even me, I, I use it a lot and I can't use my 43 days of the year. And so we then go and I take... I know someone who could help you with that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so I take, say, 20 people out on a boat and I might take a mortgage broker and say, hey, you have your Christmas party on my boat. I then go and get to meet 10 or 15, 20 new people. And I say, if you go out for coffee with someone for an hour, you build a certain relationship. You go and spend four hours playing golf with them, you get an even better relationship and you break down a lot of barriers. You go drinking for 10 or 12 hours on a boat, <laughs> you break down a lot of barriers. And, again, it's not to try and force sell people, but people want to say, well, I hear you rent your boat or you syndicate your boat. I hear you rent your house. I hear you've got cars that appreciate in value rather than depreciate. I gather you fly for free. And so I want to be known as the person that's got, I guess, all these hacks for all these things to have the million-dollar lifestyle without being the millionaire and the byproducts property. You know what you do very well, and you'll probably know this, is that you seed things along the way so in conversation you just you just drop and people go oh, he's a wanker and i'm sure you've been accused of that yeah yeah uh, but with the lamborghini the engine noise is so so loud that when people <laughs> shout you don't know if they're saying great car or you're an absolute tosser <laughs> he's a wanker guys <laughs> no i take that back um so but you're very good and i think we can all learn from this is just to seed those interesting points about either yourself or your business in conversations with prospects you know so yeah just was in jordan last week and hopped on a camel and, and then you move on and but what do you do that in a calculated way maybe you used to now it feels like it just maybe flows. a bit 50 50 but but what it's doing is i mean every conversation you must have people go hang hang sorry Tell tell me, just, yeah. No, 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 and no, no. Let, and let, let's go back. They go don't back. get it straight away. Tell yeah. me about that camel or tell me about how have you got a house with 360-degree views or yeah. you, you're just dropping these little nuggets along the way that people attach themselves to. And that's what excites an... me because you'll see my eyes will suddenly yeah, brighten yeah, up yeah. even on a hangover or something like that <laughs> because I just love teach. Like I could never understand at school why anyone would want to be a teacher. It's got to be the worst job in the world, whereas now effectively yeah. I am a teacher and I love it. Yes, but so this I, I, is. It's interesting. Can I? I had that uh, discovery a few years ago too, and it's a major reason why I do this. This show is is teaching. I mean, there is something very honourable about it, and it's lovely to see other people's eyes light up. And you know, but most people's question is exactly what you said a while ago: is why would you let your secrets out, and why would you give it away for free? If you make so much money from property investing, why would you go and do this? And everyone is sceptical. And, and look, I was an accountant. I'm sceptical on most things. But the reality is is that people do love doing stuff and they do love doing stuff for other people, for charities and things like that. So that is the reality. If people believe it or not, don't really care. Mm-hmm. But talking about the seeding thing and the marketing, my wife is a, um, a trainer for sales. And every time she hears me having a conversation with a client, she almost throws herself, with 10 stories up, almost throws herself off the balcony. And Deloitte's, my accountant, say the same thing. Because in sales, you're supposed to ask questions. And you're supposed to explore the client. I don't. I'm a teller. You're a storyteller. And I just say, this is what I do. This is what I've got to offer. You either like it or you don't. And that's it. Is that because what you you do and what you have to offer is very interesting? To most people, who I, you want to I, appeal to, I, I don't like selling, and I'm scared of selling, oh, and I'm nervous of it. I don't believe it. that. But and this the, again, that's the funny that. thing. You love it, and so, but I love it when it goes right. But I you're don't like want to make minder. cold calls. Well, you're like Arthur, you know, <laughs> the binder. Yeah. Hello, I got a mo- got a new motor. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I I love selling or leading people that want to be led and want to be sold to, but I can't stand pushing people when they don't want to. So I do a lot of things and I organise lots of events and I'm great if people want to come, but I'm the worst one. If you can't fill a room and for whatever reason it's not going, I'm no good at getting a crowd from one room and putting them in the next room. Mm-hmm. But if, if like, people want to be sheep and they, they want a leader, then I can be great at that. You're the man. Yeah. 
So uh, talking about best marketing, I think you probably answered it, Chris, in terms of the best marketing that you do is is you tell stories and you're a great networker. You're always looking, no matter where you are, you're looking for that opportunity to strike a conversation. But again, with the... So I'm actually fairly introverted, which again, most people wouldn't believe. <laughs> um, but I, like at home, I'm very, very quiet. I, I get that. I, I am too, but people wouldn't believe it either. But I, I get that. You kind of... You, when you're on, Because I'm you're outperforming. On. Yeah. You're outperforming effectively. And so... Where I go into a room, my wife will hit 98 out of 100 people, I hit two, but I have good conversations with them. And that's the thing is, is sure, I can network, but I only network with people I like. So if I don't really like a person, I'm not going to network and build a relationship with them just because I can get business out of it or I can see they can do something for me. I haven't got the time, I've got no interest, and I'm almost like I'll go out there, put myself out there, say all my stuff... And be completely open. So mm-hmm. I'll tell them about my personal finances. The rest of it, I don't hide anything. And I'll just hang with the people that are naturally attracted. Kind of the low, low-hanging fruit in a way. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Two, two good conversations is better than 98 kind of top-level yeah. conversations. If we visited your social media, you touched on it earlier, uh, are we going to see just a whole lot of lifestyle pics? Behind the scenes, here's Chris, you know. Yeah, pretty much. We, we haven't been great as a business doing social media. Um, a mate of mine's Kerwin Ray. I don't know if you know. He's, no, he's quite a big uh, marketing guy. He was doing a, a social media thing, and he was talking about all the hashtags and how that works in Instagram. Oh, yeah. I've been using it for a few years. I've never used a hashtag. <laughs> I just couldn't be bothered. But he said that's how people sort things yeah, and yeah, the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. So I started trying to put two or three in there. Right. But I'm just, it's not my thing. I, I get on with Facebook, and yeah, it's putting car pictures and experiences, hanging out with mates, and, and doing some fun stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't think that's my skill base. You said you're pretty open with your numbers. Can you wrap some numbers around where your empire is at today, yeah, yeah. 2018? So the, the biggest thing is the portfolio. So my portfolio is around 15, 16 million. Um, your, your personal my, one? My property portfolio, yeah. So I've got about 13 to 14 properties. I was going to say, in Sydney, that's about two properties. Yeah. It? <laughs> um, so about 13 to 14, just over a million each. Um, probably about 60% geared or so. So about, say, 10 million of debt. And so I, my philosophy is I believe the market will rise at 5 or 10% over the long term. So I'm banking on making 750 to 1.5 million a year and not paying tax because I'm not selling it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, that's where my real money is. In terms of the business, we turn over roughly one and a half, two million $2 million. We might make anywhere from naught to half a million dollars profit depending on the marketing spend, which a lot of it is travel and entertaining, not that it's deductible, unfortunately. Mm. Um and so I really run that business more as, look, happy to do it, it gets me out there, it pays for all my living, lifestyle, property, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I had a new guy come in the business that's almost like a CEO now. And originally when he came in two years ago, he said, right, let's build it up to 5 or $10 million. And we went through all the numbers and went through all the marketing and all those things. But two years it's come round, he's actually said, well, no, because even for him, the money isn't in the, in the business it's again for him is to extract wages or or income out of it to then turn that into property portfolios Mm -hmm. because the business isn't necessarily be that scalable. It's not necessarily um, saleable because there's no recurring revenue. And so suddenly he's seen how much clients' properties have grown in that time and he thinks, well, it doesn't make sense. And there's nothing better than having someone that really pulls your business apart and comes round to the same conclusion that, that you've got as well. Property prices in Australia certainly Melbourne and Sydney, but I think nationally have gone nuts over the last few years. Has that impacted your business because there's just not as many sellers and people are holding on knowing that uh, they've got to get back into the market if they sell? Sure. So, so normally we would have about 10 or 20 customers at any one, any one time that are pre-approved, ready to buy, effectively in a queue. The last three or four years we've had 50 or 60. Wow. It's been a nightmare. nightmare. So you think it's great, like you've got three times as many clients, but because we're so selective... So plenty of other of the competition would buy any old property at any old price, whereas we're very strict in terms that we'll only buy in blue chip suburbs, we'll buy it based on a bank valuation which is super conservative and we can't go, we can't go off that. So we're making our job 10 times as hard mm-hmm. as it, it would be. But I know I can sleep well because I know every single property we bought in 10 years has been on bank valuation, every single client's made money. Hmm. So there's no, there's nothing better than walking down the street like that. When's number 60 in that list going to get a property? And that's the problem. And so you then have the conversation with the client to say, 
look, the market's rising at 10 grand a month and we want to find you a good property, but at the same time, we don't want to rush. And all the clients did actually come back and say, we're not in a rush, we don't want to jump in, we don't want to overpay. Now, some of them didn't end up buying and they, they get a refund, so they pay some of the fees up front and, and we refund 100% if they don't buy. Um, so at least we'd never overpaid for a property. Because if you go and pay 50 or 100 grand over and the market suddenly stops or it does drop 5 or 10%, suddenly you've got a client that's lost 100 grand. Yep. I'd rather not satisfy them and maybe they're pissed off that we didn't buy. But they didn't lose 100 grand. They didn't lose 100 grand. Because I couldn't stand walking down the street saying that guy's ripped me off or there's a bad online report sure. or something like that. If the worst thing I've ever done to someone is not buy a property, then okay. I, I, can live, I can live with that. What do you say, and there's many listening to business owners who are doing the 80-hour week, who are working their rings off, who are just plain busy and miserable? So I think it depends. There's, there's times that you do have to work that hard. And I've, I've certainly done it through. I mean, you look at my lifestyle, you look at all the properties, it all looks really cool and easy. It's not. Having $10 million worth of debt over you, and I've been in debt since I was 18, is hence my haircut, right? There's, there's not too much <laughs> hair. Yeah. Um, and I say to my wife is that I might not work the biggest hours and I might not work um, and do millions of calls, but I've got a big weight on my shoulders. I've still got $10 million worth of debt that even though I'm cash flow neutral now and I've, I've got money in the bank, it's still a weight on my shoulders. And that's effectively what I get paid for. Okay. And so I think at times in my business is... I've got back to, to things so bad that I've tried to will on a heart attack because I'm highly insured, so I'll get a good payout. But that was almost my only get-out-of-jail-free card. Is that true? Yep, yep. Tell me so, about the lowest point. So so that was pretty much it. So um, I probably had two or three times that property doesn't always go up consistently and you get periods that it goes flat for three or four years and you get periods where the banks aren't lending any money and it's really, really tough. Business, as we all know, for like I was doubling my turnover every year, but my first turnover was eight grand. So then you go to 26 and then you go to 50 and 100. So it's doubling turnover, mm -hmm. but you're investing more and more money in the business all the time. So most people in business, it's worse than having a job. It's a bloody liability. Mm. And I make jokes about it in the um, in the seminars I do. Is like, uh, when do you ever make any money for business? And people laugh and you, you know straight away who's in business. Yeah, right. Because it's tough. Business mm -hmm. is tough. Mm -hmm. And you've got to work hard and there's no option. And so I, I almost need this. So I go from feast to famine in a way. And so I suddenly have lots of money. I go and invest it in property and I overbuy too much. So suddenly I've got no money. Then I feel poor. Then I've got to get on the phones and do, do yeah, some right. work. <laughs> and then I go feast a famine, which I'm kind of over that now. Yeah. And so now I'm trying to build my buffer to say I want 10 years' money in the bank so that I don't have to worry about it again. But business is it's always tough. There's Even the biggest businesses around town, oh, no it's doubt. ups and downs. If you're not on, on the ball all the time and you get too cocky, something changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when are you going to retire? Like literally like take the foot off the pedal and just enjoy what you've created? Yeah, so look, th this year's been a big change. So so I've got uh, a guy, Lewis, in there now who's, who's pretty much running the show. And so this is when both of us said, right, let's cancel mornings. And it really is I'm only doing stuff if I want it. So we only have clients if we like them. If we don't like them, we're, we're not going to take them How on. How do you establish whether you like a client? Is it an immediate kind of... Intuition? Yeah, I or? think generally you do. Yeah, okay. And if clients, say, become a pain up the backside, sorry if there's any clients out there, yeah. we'll have an honest conversation. If if they're wanting a million-dollar property for 800 grand and they want it within a few days, we won't even take them on in the first place. Mm -hmm. We'll say, look, it's it's not going to happen. We don't buy properties half price in Bondi, St Kilda, Paran, all those areas because it just doesn't, doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so I think we know because... Most people, when they're selling clients, they say, oh, I'll get you this for half price and it'll, it'll go up at 20% a year and it'll be amazing. We almost undersell what we do so that then people are saying, no, no, I still want it. I, th I think that that's yeah, the way. Okay. Just want to finish, you You had a book, you've got a book called... Uh, the Effortless Empire. The Effortless Empire. You wrote that a number of years ago. You said you've given away sixty to 70,000 copies. We've had a number of self-publishers on this show and I say to anyone who listens, I write a book, it's a glorified business card and if you yeah. have to give it away, give it away because so what's it done for your business giving away that many copies? So when I first got into TV then uh, I got published 
so we were going to do a TV show and uh, the TV show didn't come off, but the book did. And so I was in Dimmux, um, David Jones took all the photos for mum. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing experience. Yeah. Don't think I ever got a royalty check. I'm not sure how many got sold. Mm-hmm. And that was the whole thing. It's the kudos of being published. Yes. But then I met an amazing girl, uh, Lisa Messenger, who's pretty well known around town, and she came up with a concept of do you want to sell a $25 book or a 25 grand client? And so it was exactly as you say. It's basically a brochure. Everyone will throw a brochure in the bin, but not many people will throw a book. They'll take it to the the charity store or something like that or they'll give it to a friend or they'll keep it on the book bookshelf for five years. They might read it. Yep, they <laughs> might. And and we do get people that say, I've had it on my bookshelf for five years, moved house. I should have read it uh, when you gave it to me. Well, I gave it to you. There's not a lot more I could do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's great because it puts it out there. It's powerful, isn't it? And the way we wrote the book was the marketing company listening to 20 client conversations. And every time the client asked a question or I made a point, they wrote down a post-it note. They put them in order for designing the website to say, this is the journey we take them down. And I said, well, that's a book in that. So we actually wrote the book in four hours because it was recorded. And we literally haven't changed a word in 10 years apart from the average property price, I think, 10 years ago was 500 grand. Now it's a million, so we've changed changed Mm -hmm. that. Price is doubling every uh, every seven or ten years, and it's the best thing because people come to me and I don't want to spend two or three hours with every single person that wants free advice. So I'll say, if you want a meeting, read the book. That's going to answer ninety eight percent of your questions. Then, if you still want a meeting with me, we can concentrate on the two or three questions that you didn't really understand or the, the few concepts. So there's a reason for them to do it. So now I don't get a hundred emails a day or a thousand phone calls mm-hmm. because. Most of the people will take the book and say, thanks, I'll go off and read it and go and do it. The other people won't even read the book. And then the ones that do want a meeting have generally read the book or it's been by referral, and so they've probably got a 50 to 80% chance of converting. Genius. Chris, I've got to get back to work, mate. I know you've got to go and check the ice in the boats uh, <laughs> being delivered. Thanks for sharing. My and, pleasure. Uh, it's a great story and uh, half of me hates you, half of me loves you. It's wonderful. <laughs> thanks very much. Well, there you go, team. Your empire's Chris Gray. (laughs) Do you hate him or do you love him? I love him. He's a great bloke. Certainly a great bloke to interview and some wonderful insights. Coming up, I'm going to share my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Chris. Plus, in this week's Ignite Your Site segment, you'll discover why more content on your website ain't necessarily better. Cash flow in business is everything, right? That's why I'm excited to introduce you to Prosper, Australia's number one online lender to Aussie small businesses. But don't take my word for it. Small business owner Nioli Scobie of Truly Tea won the contract to supply the Opera House and needed to quickly ship tens of thousands of tea bags and two tonnes of loose leaf tea. Where was she going to get the money for that? Okay, well, I already supplied, you know, part of the Opera House and then they offered me, um, you know, inside the Opera House, which is a very big deal, and I had to have a lot of stock on hand. You can't say no to the Opera House when they they place an order, they want it the next day, and those are the terms of trade, and I wasn't going to say no to them. I'd knocked back too many opportunities in the past, so I phoned up a, a finance guy I trusted. He said, look, there's a new player on the market, Prosper, give them a call. I gave them a call, and within... 24 hours, I had the money in the bank. Prosper, P-R-O-S-P-A. That's where she got the money. Apply online in 10 minutes to borrow up to $250,000. Call 1-300-882-867 or visit prosper.com forward slash Timbo. Here's a money-making tip from American Express member and Four Pillars Gin founder, Stu Greger. I, for the life of me, don't understand why a business won't accept Amex because what you're potentially doing is knocking back customers who want to spend money on your product or your brand or your service or whatever it is. And I frankly don't understand it. 
someone wants to give me their Amex and buy 10 bottles of gin, I'll tell you what, I'll take their Amex, thanks very much. You're potentially also denying yourself a big chunk of corporate business as well. You know, because a lot of sales guys, a lot of guys, I know me in my own business, I use Amex. And if I get a, a if I ring to make a booking at a restaurant or a bar or something, I say, do you accept Amex? And they say, no, I go somewhere else. So they don't even know the business they're, they're missing out on. It beggars belief. And I often find myself having these rather awkward conversations at the <laughs> with with a shopkeeper or a or a bar owner or a restaurateur saying, why wouldn't you take it? I'll pay you the extra. I'll pay one and a half. Oh, the credit card service fee or whatever you want. Take my money. It's business 101, really. Make it easy for people to give you money. Speaking of money, the American Express Business Explorer credit card comes with 50,000 bonus points every year, a low interest rate, and two points on every dollar you spend. Not to mention a couple of tickets to the very swish Amex Lounge at Sydney International Airport. Search Amex Business to find out more. New American Express card members only. Terms and conditions apply. All righty, my top three attention grabbers from my chat with Chris Gray, thanks to Design Crowd, American Express and Prosper. Attention grabber number one. I love, love, love Chris's approach to networking, where in a room of, say, 100 prospects, he'd rather have two deep conversations than 98 shallow ones. Totally agree with that. Tick. Attention grabber number two, I've got to tell you, Chris is the master seeder, constantly inserting, quite subtly, points about his business and himself into the conversation. I, I didn't find it distracting. I thought it was quite clever. I hope you did too. You might think, oh, he's a bit of a wanker, but I think you would probably agree with me that he, he did it quite nicely. <laughs> I say wanker lovingly. And attention grabber number three... I think we all need to get out and smell the roses more often. You and me. Just got to get out. Have some fun. Look up. It's blue sky outside. Maybe get an Amex card. <laughs> Help you, won't it? Fly at the pointy end of the plane. Love that. What grabbed your attention? Please head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 409 and let me know. With so many underperforming business websites out there, this segment is laser focused on ensuring yours is not one of them. To get your website found and your phone ringing, imagine those two things happening. It's extraordinary. We're joined by Dave Jennings of MelbourneSEOServices.com. DJ, what is on your mind? Every business owner needs to be updating their website to be HTTPS. I know, it's geeky. I hear laugh. I hear Google laugh. Alert. <laughs> HTTP, what? You, this is something that uh, Google has implemented. Yes. Uh, where they are now giving a ranking benefit to secure websites. Not only that, have you ever visited a website in Chrome and in the top left-hand corner, sometimes it says not secure. Yes. Or you get like a little exclamation yeah, yeah, point. Yeah, freaks you out. Move exactly on. right. That you, you want to go with a website that says secure and it's got the green lock. That's what HTTPS offers. And it actually affects your ranking if you don't have it. Correct. Interesting. Google is now watching and they've said it's a ranking factor. How does one enter the geek kingdom of <laughs> HTTPS? <laughs> well, they could call me and I could help. Or you go to your... Probably a good start. That is a good place to start. You could also head to your host. A lot of the hosting companies will be able to do that upgrade for you. It's easy. It's kind of like just flicking a switch. You've got to get right. it swapped over, though. It is that easy, is it? You literally bring your host and say, hey, guys... Secure things up, tighten it up. Yeah, maybe I made Ish. it sound it easier than it is. Oh, well. Like, that's where you contact me if you end up getting okay. stuck. So that is one more way to get your website in beautiful shape so you do get more calls yes. and more inquiry. Uh, you've got an additional way, which is you're offering free copies of your wonderful Amazon bestseller, Authority Content. How do people exactly get right. that? You can just head over to authoritycontent.com forward slash Timbo and uh, claim your free copy. It is only available free through that Timbo link. Otherwise, Love you have it. to buy it. DJ, that is just one more way to... Ignite your sight. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. 
Oh, yes, come on down in Deedly Doodly. Love the monster prize. We'll love giving away prizes to you guys. Now, before we find out who are the two winners today, all you need to do to win a prize on this show is this. Tell me about one idea that you've implemented from listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show and what impact it's had on your business. Then you can write it in an email or email an audio or video file to me, Tim at timreid, R-E-I-D, dot com dot au. If I choose yours, I'll read it out here and send you a prize that's been kindly donated by a past guest. Plus, how's this? Past guest, Steve Richards, racing car legend, has kindly provided one hot lap. They'll get it two and a half grand, which I'm going to give away to the letter of the year later this year. All righty, let's find out what today's winners have implemented and, by the way, where they went wrong. Mm. Get my back up a little bit here. You'll have to excuse me, winners. First one is Emily Chatham. Oh, my God. Where do I start, Timbo? She says, I started listening to your show about two years ago. Your guest from Western Australia who showcased her gear at the Oscars was amazing. Our branding got redone by some professionals soon after that interview. I hope you used Design Crowd. Then Willie Smith's. Actually, that episode is to blame for my current drinking problem. <laughs> that was a fun episode, the uh, cider brand out of Tasmania. Then the beer episodes. I don't drink beer generally, but from those episodes, I took the need to believe in yourself. So true. I, get, I take that from a lot of episodes, Emily, with my guests. you just got to believe in yourself. That's will take you a long way to success. Um, then she goes on to say local area marketing. I can't remember who that was. That was the guys from Community Notice Board from memory, Joe and Joel. Uh, anyway, we now have an employee whose job it is to do the little community marketing events, the school fates, the farmer's markets, things like that. That's genius. Huxterburger, she goes on. From that, I've nearly finished my own recipe book, Why Hide the Knowledge, she says. And Jules Lund and his social influencer marketing business called Tribe. She's, uh, Emily's slowly reaching out to social media influencers and now we have our biggest web traffic coming from those collaborations. Wow, you've learned a lot from this show, Emily. So I guess the real thing is, what episodes haven't I been able to implement from? Maybe none. Cheers, Emily Chatham, Village Education with a side hustle of Taste Buddies. Now... Um, couple of whinges here. Oh, by the way, Emily, <laughs> thank you. Before I whinge, Emily, you have won. Drum roll. A limited edition black leather orbit key valued at 50 bucks. Thanks to Rex Quo from orbitkey.com. Here's my whinge. Emily's email signature is pretty average. There's no links. There's no phone number. There's nothing. I don't actually know what she does, right? So get a good email signature. I've written a blog post on how to nail your in, your email signature, how to turn it into a selling machine. So um, I'll put a link in the show notes so that you can have a look. Um, and there, that was a bit of a hard email to read, and, and some of them that I'm that I'm getting are now. If you are sending um, a press release uh, or a pitch to someone in the media, guys, make sure that the spelling and grammar and everything is tickety boo. Because the chances are they may read it verbatim. And if they can't, it's just going to make it hard for them and they might not do it. Okay? So that's my winch. It's not so bad. But it applies to Emily's note and it applies to Anna Smith's note, who is the second winner. A bit of an av email signature. Got a phone number there. But no, but no, um, I just noticed she's from overseas. But no website address. Okie dokie. Now, Anna says, hi, Tim. Hello, Anna. I'd love to win some of that loot. (laughs) Good on you. I've listened to loads of your podcasts. There are many things I've implemented after listening to them. Proof of how they have helped our business is yet to be seen, though, as we're still working on getting our products to market. That's okay. At least you started your marketing. But here's what we've done. We've decided to connect with a local orphanage to partner in helping the kids who need to leave the orphanage by way of training and or employment. Beautiful. 
Uh, number two thing that she's implemented, decided to hero the story of the product and how it came to be and are using it in our new website being launched this month. That's an example, guys, of like, I don't actually know what she means there, right? What product? What story? Um, signed up for MailChimp and are currently drafting our first mail out. Love that. Going to use video and stories to tell people about what we're doing. And beyond that, video unrelated to the products, more on the stuff we love. Great quality design engineering. Cool. So a bit of behind the scenes video is videoing as well. And more than that. See you later, Anna Smith. Hey, well done, Anna. Now, I am going to have to figure out what prize to give you because I've just realised you are from overseas and some of the prizes don't dispatch to overseas. But I think what I'm going to do is give you a $100 voucher that you can claim online thanks to Lucy and Joe from Hunting for George, the homeware store Hunting for George. There you go. You can use that online, get it sent to you wherever you are. And that team is the Small Business Big Marketing Monster Prize Draw for another week. Now, you may remember Tom O'Toole from episode 336. Tom is lovingly considered Australia's craziest baker. He's also the founder of the famous Beechworth Bakery. And he's well known for calling a spade a shovel. Tomorrow... Tom and his best mate Keith are heading off on a road trip to raise money for cancer research in regional Australia. And I caught up with him on the eve of them starting the engine. Hello, Tim. Coming in Earth to Tom. Okay. I look, now, I've only ever did Skype... (laughs) On my wife's uh, laptop, so that's what I'm doing now. So I don't know. I, I, is that okay? Can it's pretty hit? impressive, mate. I mean, you've, you're coming through as if you know you're on Skype talking to me. Okay. <laughs> Technology, eh? That's good. That's good. I think first question, Tom. Are we going to be able to do this in like ten minutes? Yes, I think so. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> All right, buddy. Now, what on earth are you up to? Well, look, here we are, Keith and I, me mate Keith McIntosh, been me mate since I was 16. We're taking this 19A model Ford across Australia. 1930, I think, not 19. That'd be that'd be like really, really early. 1930. It's got no doors. It's a bakery van, no seatbelts, no doors. Uh, we've got no support crew, and we're going to take it from the most eastern point which, of Australia, which is Byron Bay, straight through the guts of Australia, you know, out through Cullamulla, Windora, Birdsville, across to Alice Springs and out to Ayers Rock, uh, across to Leonora <laughs> and up to Sandstone, Mount Magnet, off to Steep Point, which is the most western point of of um, of, uh, of Australia. Of this, of so, this lucky country. Tom, it's just, just describe, given this is an audio medium, describe... A- Model T Ford for us? Well, it's a, it's a Model A. Model so A. It's a, it's a very little thing. It's very little. When we sit in it, Keith and I, like I said, there's no doors. So we shoulder to shoulder. It's very narrow. And so when you're on the freeway, the highway, a lot of cars, especially the trucks, don't see you because we're small. <laughs> They're looking over the top of us. Um, it's a little bakery van, like people say, oh, do you sleep in the back? But the back only can take our swags and a couple spare tyres. That's it. Um it's, uh, it's she'd, just she'd get like, up to a fair clip, wouldn't it? Like we're talking 100, 150k an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we do. If we if we if we average it, probably about 35, 40 kilometres an hour. We can average. <laughs> if we if we can we can do 50 kilometres an hour with a tailwind and uh, uh, downhill. But um, geez, I hope you and Keith are good mates, Tom. <laughs> we good mates. We good mates. You are, so. just just to be really clear here, you're in a Model A Ford from 1930. You're going seven and a half thousand kilometres across Australia, east to west. You want to do it in 30 days at a clip of no more than 50 kilometres an hour. Have I missed anything? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Do, Why are you doing this, Tom? Hours. We do long. I'm, I'm doing it. Look, what I'm doing it for is to raise money for this, uh, the Fiona Cancer Research Institute. It's the only 
Cancer Research Institute in regional Australia. They get no government funded and they're not tied up with any big pharmaceuticals. They re rely on totally uh, uh, community-based and they have, they're doing amazing stuff. They've got, I think, 10 PhD students there this year, but they've got scientists from uh, overseas. It's a, it's a, it's a world-renowned, it's, it's world-class. It really why, is world Why is this, there's a lot of charities out there, there's a lot of people raising money for a lot of different things. Why is this close to yours and Keith's heart? Oh, well, look, look, uh, well, I think who hasn't been touched by cancer? You know, mm. my mum died of cancer. I was with her when she died. It was a terrible, terrible way to go. And uh, Keith's mum, she died of cancer, not not old. Mm. And uh, my brother was just diagnosed with stage four cancer last week. Oh, my. Uh, uh, my accountant's got cancer. Who hasn't? You know, so many people have been. And 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 and, and you know, uh, it's it's a cunning, baffling uh, bastard of a disease. This this cancer. You got your back up about it. No wonder. Oh. So it's and and this is Fiona Elsie. This cancer research is called the Fiona Elsie Cancer Research, and she was a twelve-year-old who passed away with cancer. But she totally believed the answer was in research, and and she got a promise out of this Dr. George that he would build a, a, a cancer research institute in Ballarat. And and anyway, he was busy. And a couple of years later, the, uh, the Fiona's mother ran into him. She said, "George, have you did anything about?" building this research institute. He said, oh, oh you know, and, 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 and I met George and he said, oh, it's, I thought better do something. So he got people together and it's incredible how they've built this. Uh, because, you know, like cancer, it, 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 it touches, it, it can be a very lonely uh, mm. lonely journey and uh, and uh, it's that fear of the unknown yeah. with that cancer. That's a bit like this trip across Australia, the fear of the unknown. Are we going to make it? What, uh, Tom, Tom, what could go wrong? I mean, you seem to, you, no seatbelts, you're, you're flying along, no one could get you, no one could yeah. see you apparently. <laughs> what uh, what well, could go we, wrong? Put some LED lights on the back, we did, so. Uh, oh, that's good. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. But I tell you, the dash, the dash, where our, our knees hit the dash, and that's the fuel tank. The fuel tank oh, is God. the dash. That, that's the way A-model Fords are built. And on each side of us is a fuel jerry can beside each side of us on the running boards. So if we get hit, we're going to go up in a big plane. Well, the air, look, the airbags would look after you, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Because they air conditioned. Yeah, we got air conditioning. No doors <laughs> on the buddy. What are you and Keith? Going to talk about for thirty? I mean, I think it's going to take longer than thirty days. But in close quarters, well, we've got to get back on the twenty. So we're leaving on Wednesday, the twenty first of, of March, and we want to get back uh, on the twenty seventh of April because it's his fiftieth wedding anniversary. He reckons oh. he's plenty of our wedding anniversary. He's not caring, but his wife wants him back. But um, <laughs> uh, look, uh, people say, "Oh, you're uh, you're a mechanic," and I'm no mechanic. I'm a baker, but. Uh, Keith fixed his lawnmower once, so he thinks he's a mechanic, and the lawnmower is not going now. But yeah, I'll give you a couple of games. You can play Spoto along the way. Have you ever? We well, look. We've been. I've been. Keith's seventy-five this year. He's a fit, Jeez. healthy guy. But he, um, uh, I've been his mate since uh, sixteen, uh, and I'm sixty-six. So you know, uh, clickety click, sixty-six. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, I wish you. I, I think there should be more Tomo tools and Keiths in the world. Uh, good on you, matey. I wish you all the best. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking in. Uh, where, where should we check in, do you think? You know, some kind of inspired <laughs> monument or... Uh... Well, at the Kalamala Palau, the Kalamala out of Kalamala. They got, I don't know, you wouldn't notice a slim, <laughs> dusty song, the Kalamala Palau. There's a big statue of it. Uh, oh, I love it. A Windor, a Birdsville. They're all iconic, incredible places. These. Well, we will, we will touch base halfway through and when you get to the end. Most but importantly, though, we we get it. We never know <laughs> that that yeah. You know, we leave every day with this football affair. But I tell you, we don't. We don't. People say, "What happened when we break down?" And uh, Keith prays. That's about all he's good for. is praying, and and I, uh, you know, I. Anyway, it, it's a simple little car. Hopefully, two simple men in a simple little car raising money for a very complicated disease. And if anyone wants to donate, whether it's a dollar or a million dollars, if there is a million dollar donator out there, please go for it. Over to East to west.com.au is where you've got this wonderful fundraising page on the Fiona Elsie website, Tommy. So east to west.com.au 
anything would make a difference. And I guess you're shaking a can along the way, eh? Hey, we are, but trouble is there's not many people out through the guts of Australia. There's not, <laughs> it's not many, many at all. There's not many people out there, so we are relying on the social media a fair bit. And the thing is, all I'm asking is if they could just donate a price of a cup of coffee. And everyone who listens to your uh, podcast, whatever, if they could donate... Uh, nice. Uh, price of a cup of coffee. We would look. I've set this big goal that's really stretching me. That I make that we raise a hundred thousand. Now I'm no big hot salesman. I've only raised. We'll do it, buddy. Thousand, we'll do thousand. it. I've got ninety nine thousand to go. So price of a cup of coffee at the Beechworth Bakery. What's that? It's about ten bucks these days, isn't it? So ten bucks a person. No, it's not. Not even five dollars. <laughs> not even five. You can go into our bakeries and donate money. We're going to have a map in each bakery to chart our course. We just hope we make it. We just hope we make it. So, uh, Look, worst case scenario, you put the Model A on the back of a truck, one of those ones that can't yeah, see you. No, so, You'll get there in no time. Yeah, I know. I have been t- told that that would be the sensible way. Have you seen that program, Tom, with Antonio Galluccio and another wonderful Italian chef? It's called Two Fat. Uh, is it Two Fat Italians or Two <laughs> Greedy Italians? But these two blokes travel around Italy in a lovely old car and I can just see it's like it's you and Keith mate so Uh, listen buddy um, I look forward to checking in halfway through easttowest.com.au is where you can go and leave a small or really large donation all the best Tom thank you Tim what a character I love Tom O'Toole we're going to catch up with Tommy midway through the trip and when he gets to the other side at Shark Bay or wherever he was headed. Hey, you and I do meet a lot of characters on this show, don't we? We've previously caught up with the inventor Scott Bocock, who had a blindingly simple idea come to him when he was hanging out his wife's little black dress, her LBD. And we caught up with Steve Huey a few years ago from I Fly Flat, who's created a solid little business from helping you accumulate points to, well, fly flat. <laughs> Love that. You'll find those episodes plus hundreds more over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com or you can subscribe free on your favourite podcast app, which means that you will never miss another episode. I'd love to hear from you. You can head over to the contact button over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com where you can email me, you can connect with me on social media, buy my book. Uh, By the way, Check out Design Crowd, the world's number one custom design marketplace where you can access 550,000 graphic designers and get the perfect design every time, guaranteed. Plus, you get 100 bucks off if you use the link designcrowd.com forward slash Timbo. That's a really, really good offer. Speaking of good offers, big thank you to Prosper, Australia's number one online lender to small businesses. You can check them out at prosper.com forward slash Timbo. And a big thank you to Amex, to American Express, whose business explorer card clearly got Chris Gray where he needed to go. Um, you can check all that out over at, if you, if you search Amex Business, um, the whole world will open up to you. If you love the Small Business Big Marketing Show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it for them. I love you to do that. Until next week, I am Timbo Reed. Always have been, always will be. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.